we have got a bounce here. Yields higher, equities higher. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. Equities up seven tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, the S&P entering correction. Equities have already had a 10% correction, YTD. There are a lot of cross currents for sure. You have two distinct risk drivers. We've got a geopolitical environment, tensions with Russia and the Ukraine. But also what was going on before that? The angst around the first Fed rate hike. Central banks being behind the curve. And the market has priced them in a very different way. Well, I'll tell you what, it's going gonna, it's gonna to remain volatile. Risk assets can, can definitely grind lower from here. Get to read and react market. There's lots of uh, potentially negative news flows. We're being very, very patient, very, very cautious. The next couple of weeks are are likely to continue to be very volatile. You're still in a in a bend, having broken mode. The only thing certain this year was uncertainty. Joining us now is Pimco's Erin Brown, BlackRock's Tony Dispirito, and JP Morgan's Clinton Warren. Erin, I want to begin with you. Not every 10% correction is created equally. I want to understand from your perspective if this is one you buy or stay away from. I think over the next couple of weeks, we're still going to be in a volatile period. So really timing the bottom is difficult. But I think when you step away and look at the fundamentals, the fundamental picture for equities is still quite strong. And I think, you know, I've been somewhat heartened to see that the markets are not panicking. And when you look outside of equities, if you look at credit spreads, if you look at inflation swaps, if you look at twos, tens, they're still telling you that the fundamental picture for equities is, is still OK. Um, and you are seeing fundamentals firming on the economic front. So I think over a medium term perspective, you would do well buying here. But the next couple of weeks are going to be continue to choppy, be, continue to be choppy. And, you know, certainly we could see downside risk from here. Aaron, given where twos tens are and you say that's the OK to carry on buying equities, do you think it is OK with twos tens south of 40 now and heading in a direction where we go flatter, flatter, flatter? Right. Well, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that you haven't seen significant volatility. You haven't seen a significant flight to quality on the moves of late, um, you know, particularly with regard to the geopolitical situation. I do think, though, that as we move later cycle and as the curve continues to flatten, it does start to, I think, bring up concerns regarding whether or not we're moving very late cycle and whether or not a recession is sort of knocking on the door for markets. I think we're too early yet to price that in, but certainly that is going to be a concern for markets as we move throughout this year. Yeah, Clinton, it's the back end story, the back end of 2022. This is something Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley has been talking about. Here's the quote from him. We think Fed tightening is well understood at this point, even if it's not fully discounted in multiples. From here, the depth and duration of the ongoing correction will be determined primarily by the magnitude of the slowdown in the first half of 22 and looking out to the back end of next year. Your thoughts on that, Clinton, your take at the moment? Yeah, I mean, my position is don't fight or fear the Fed. I mean, we rates are at such low rates that we have a lot of room to to go before they become punitive. I'm saying if the the Fed hikes eight times, gets gets to two percent, we're still at a at a non-punitive uh, uh, track for equity markets. Uh, so I, I'm not I'm not fearful of the Fed moving, and I think some of this uh, recent news with Russia and Ukraine will probably put pressure on the Fed to not go 50 basis points on March 16th and more like 25 basis points. But one of the things I am watching to your earlier point, John, is that uh, the, the curve is, is flattening. And uh, I don't believe that we're going to have a, a yield inversion. But it does put, put some worry into my mind if the tenure doesn't move. We need to get that tenure move in. And hopefully with, some, with the Fed, stop purchasing some of the longer term bonds. We'll see the Fed move uh, or, or the tenure move up. But, we're, but it's something that we're watching. And it is a risk to mark. Tony, I want to pick up on what Clinton just said. Don't fear the Fed. Let's talk about that. There are three ways of looking at this. The start of the journey, the speed, the destination. What matters here for you? The pace, how many rate hikes we get in this year, say, or the ultimate destination? How low that ultimate peak is? Uh, it's clearly about what is the destination. Um, I don't think the, the pace matters so much. Um, you know, right now, uh, the Fed is behind. It needs to catch up. It's achieved its goals. We have relatively full employment. employment unemployment's at 4%. Uh, we've made up for historical undershoot of inflation. Uh, so I think that's good. 
Um, so we're now in a point where we can the Fed can eliminate or move away from this extraordinarily uh, accommodative policy it's had, the emergency policy that it's had. And so I think that's good. And then when I look at markets, I see two things. I look at fundamentals, um, which are still very strong. Um, they're, you know, they're moderating from the pace uh, that we're at last year, but earnings are still going up uh, for the S&P 500. Uh, and valuations are down by about 10%. Um, and so I see that as attractive. And ultimately, you, know, you look at the 10, where the 10 years today, 2%. Uh, it would take a 10 year of about 3 to 3.5% three before I would no longer look at equities as the most attractive asset class. 150 basis points higher than where we are, Tony. Really? Why that high? Yes. That, that's that's the, uh, the math of our dividend discount model. We look at the historical equity risk premium. We look at the current equity risk premium, which is way higher than historical averages. Um, and that's that's the number uh, the model that the model comes out with. And it makes sense based on on long term history. The stock market never fully incorporated ultra low rates. That's the punchline. 25 minutes away from the opening bound. The punchline this morning, equities up for now, up 7 tenths of 1% after closing at four-month lows in yesterday's session. With more on this, let's get to Taylor Riggs. Hey, Taylor. John, it was a big day on the closing bell yesterday because we finally closed in correction territory on the S&P. We'd gotten there on an intraday level, but this was the first time since March of 2020 that we had closed sort of in that, quote, correction level. Now, sometimes this feels broad-based, but if you take a look at the six stocks that are accounting for 35% of the drawdown in the S&P, 500 year to date. It is the big tech stocks, right? Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, those are the big draggers here on a year to date basis. And I just want to point out from the high in September, Facebook, it's off 47% from the high in November. Microsoft is off 16%. So what that means from a sector levels, we brought in out a little bit is communications, of course, already in a bear market. Those are off more than 20% from the recent highs. Healthcare, technology, discretionary, also down more than 10% from the recent peak. So what that means, we brought in out you've this big drawdown. But indeed, again, if you take a look at the terminal, the first time since March 2020 that you're really getting that full drawdown that we've had, closing levels at 10%. And Taylor Ricks, thank you. Thank you very much. The team over at City looking at things like this, the U.S. versus, say, Europe, quote, an important driver for allocation decisions is growth. And the evolution of U.S. yields, a re-rating of growth higher leads to a style leadership rotation. Hence, investors reallocate more to global trade exposed eurozone equities. Now, Erin, a lot of people piled onto that story week after week to start the year on this program. Then all of a sudden, we face a bit of a problem in Europe. Can you walk me through how you're approaching markets globally from region to region? I think that Europe right now is still too early to buy, particularly with the geopolitical risks that you know continue to loom over the market. And I think it's going to have a much bigger impact on European equities than it will certainly in the U.S., where you know Russian exposure to U.S. equities is incredibly modest. It's you know less than one percent from a revenue perspective, but there still remains risks to Europe, particularly with respect to the energy crisis. So while there's certain pockets of European equities which I think look attractive, particularly the European banks. For the market overall, I think it's still too early to buy. And I'd be really focusing on quality bets in the U.S. as where to pick my spots for this year. And Tony, your thoughts on the same issue? Yeah, so uh, I still favor the U.S. market. Um, it's a higher quality market. Um, obviously, there's, there's less turmoil uh, in the U.S. And so um, I still favor the U.S. Within the U.S., um, I think value equities look particularly attractive given the recent rise in inflation and subsequent uh, rise uh, in rates. Uh, that definitely favors um, you know, value equities, and we've seen that uh, play out uh, this year. Clinton Warren, final word. Yeah, sorry to give you the trifecta, but I agree with both uh, Tony and Aaron. Uh, we are favored the U.S. Uh, from a geographical standpoint. Within the U.S., we're, we're favored large cap over mid and small and within U.S. large cap, we are uh, favored the defensive sector, cyclicals, dividend paying stocks. So we like equities over over bonds and cash. It's just going to be uh, you've got to be a little more specific in where you're going and high quality is where we are going for 2022. We'll keep building on where you're going for 22. Clinton staying with us alongside Aaron 
and Tony. Your equity market positive, eight tenths of 1%. Lucky to have Taylor Riggs with us for the hour. Taylor, looking at some movers this morning. Hey, Taylor. Yeah, let's take a look at the pre-market. And John, a different story when we're taking a look at Lowe's versus Home Depot when we sat here exactly 24 hours ago, right? Because Home Depot was warning about some of the inflationary and those supply chain costs. Lowe's is the opposite. They're actually saying, you know what? 2022 may not be so bad. They're looking at comps to be negative 1% to 1%, but it had seen comps as much as 3% lower. So you are getting a little bit of a marginal improvement. Take a look at Stellantis. Look, they're looking at operating income and positive industrial free cash flow. Analysts are saying it was much better than expectations, even for some of the big bulls on the street. Palo Alto is a really interesting one here because the cybersecurity company beating expectations and consensus. Stock now been raised to a neutral at JP Morgan. And Dan Ives at Wedbush seeing huge tailwinds here for the cybersecurity sector. Finally, we'll take a look, as you can see there. Activision Blizzard, our chief uh, gaming correspondent, Romain Bostic, says delaying these video games, it's not a good sign, John. Is he a gamer? He's, well, he's more than a gamer than I am. Not I, I sure that. I did not much, know that. I don't but... think I've had a, a video game <laughs> for about 30 years, maybe, Taylor. But OK, Taylor Riggs, thank you very much. Your equity market set up as follows, going into the opening bound about 20 minutes away. Just a bit of a bounce here. Coming up next, the U.S. taking a measured approach to its debut set of sanctions. We're implementing full blocking sanctions on two large Russian financial institutions, VEB and their military bank. Do those sanctions lack teeth? That conversation, I'm next. We're implementing full blocking sanctions on two large Russian financial institutions, VEB and their military bank. We're implementing comprehensive sanctions on Russian sovereign debt. That means we've cut off Russia's government from Western financing. President Biden imposing fresh sanctions against Russia while warning Americans about potential spillover effects here at home. Defending freedom will have cost for us as well and here at home. We need to be honest about that. My administration is using every tool at our disposal to protect American businesses and consumers from rising prices at the pump. Joining us now is Anne-Marie down in D.C. Morning, Anne-Marie. Good morning, John. We heard from the president there is tranche one. That is the, what the administration is calling when it comes to these sanctions. And his deputy national security advisor for international economics, Dalip Singh, said yesterday that this is the beginning of an evasion. This is the beginning of our response. And they are prepared to take more action. And then a senior U.S. administrative official, Jonathan, said that potentially what could be next up on the financial economic chopping block would be two larger banks, VTB and Spur Bank. That that would certainly hit a little bit closer to home to the Kremlin. By and large, this does just seem like a phase one, Jonathan. This isn't the mother of all sanctions, and many are actually a little bit critical of the administration that this was just a little bit potentially too moderate in terms of what's going on right now with the conflict in Ukraine. A language like the first tranche implies there's more to come. There's certainly more runway to escalate this. AMH, you catch up with the Ukrainian foreign minister a little bit later. What do they want to see? They want to see more sanctions. The foreign minister, uh, Dimitro Kuleba, said in the middle of the night today, and Jonathan, he's going to be addressing the UN General Assembly before I sit down with him, and he said we should be hitting Russia harder. Hit him now, hit him again, and he was talking about President Vladimir Putin. He stood next to Secretary of State Antony Blinken off the heels of a meeting he had with the president yesterday at the White House in the Oval Office and said he welcomed these sanctions, but more needs to be done. Let's talk about the more that needs to be done and the strategy too one part of the broader strategy is to go after the people close to the president of russia mm -hmm. and marie i just wonder how you think that's actually going to play out based on recent history based on this week and how we saw that conversation go in that televised security council meeting whether that actually makes a difference it's a great question. I think that is sometimes what individuals or those who look at the market implications of what could happen to Russia fail to recognize that if you don't look at the economics of it, right, because President Vladimir Putin doesn't seem to be deterred all the time by the economics. Jonathan, I know you know this story very well. And this was years back when President Vladimir Putin went and visited a factory and all the bosses of a factory. And he says, you all need to fix this. And he had every single one of them sign it. And then he said to billionaire Oleg Dar 
Deripaska, a billionaire very close to the Kremlin at the time. I don't see your signature. He said, come over here, had him get up. It was quite embarrassing for Oleg Deripaska, signed the paper, and as he walked away, he said, give me back my pen. This is how President Vladimir Putin treats those around him. So if you're going to sanction them, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference because I don't think President Putin cares. AMH, thank you. I'm really looking forward to your conversation here in New York with the Ukrainian Foreign Minister a little bit later this afternoon, live on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio, 3.30 Eastern Time. The geopolitical tensions have been a key theme for this program over the last few weeks. We caught up with Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab just yesterday. Wang in. It just confirmed, I think, our view that this Fed is likely to move more slowly than consensus estimates. It just confirmed that I think the market had gotten way ahead of itself in terms of expecting Fed rate hikes. And now we have this heightened political risk that's going to mean potentially tighter financial conditions. And, and that means a slower process of rate, rate increases from the Fed. And Erin, you could possibly look at this two ways. It might make the Fed go quicker if we get an energy price spike. It might make them go slower. How do you think it's going to influence this, the decision next month? Well, I think with regards to next month, Clinton's right, which is the Fed is very unlikely to move in excess of 25 basis point at the March meeting. I think that they're going to be gradual in their approach to removing accommodation. And remember, they're still balancing quantitative tightening, which will likely start later this year with rate hikes. And so I think they're going to want to be gradual in their approach. Um, so they don't, you know, have a hiccup in terms of the removal of accommodation. That said, they'll likely hike five to six times this year, and it will be a meeting by meeting decision and likely they'll move on a, a meeting to meeting basis. But I think with regards to March, we're really looking at 25 basis points. Clinton, you say don't fear the Fed. Let's go with Bank of America's numbers. Seven hikes this year, one trillion dollars of balance sheet reduction in 22, another one trillion in 23. Do you not fear that? Well, I mean, what I fear is how quickly the market's changed its expectations. I mean, just a few months ago, the market was pricing in one Fed hike for 2022, and now we're sitting at six to seven, depending on who you're talking to across Wall Street. Um, so that is something to be concerned about. But we've seen, you've seen the movement in fixed income markets already move. And what we're telling clients is to prepare for what's going to happen. So how are you going to defend your portfolio in this period of rising rates, and, and what are you going to do? And we're moving clients to uh, inflation hedge uh, portfolios uh, and infrastructure, private credit, et cetera, to try to get some sort of yield and to protect the fixed income part of the portfolio. But yeah, there's something to, to think about, but I'm not scared about it because I don't think it's going to be punitive to equity markets until we see the, you know, the, the Fed funds rate get to two, two and a half. And to, like, like uh, the other guests are saying, the 10-year spike up to, to a lot higher level. Tony, we're seeing some headlines from David Solomon of Goldman. Goldman has shown that it can grow its book value, won't replicate the 21 capital markets results in 22. But for 22, there's some appetite here, Tony. As you point out in your note, financials haven't been loved since the financial crisis, but we see a lot to like. What do you like, Tony? Uh, it's really two things. Uh, one is earnings growth. Um, Banks are interest rate sensitive. They're the only area of the economy really that directly benefits uh, from rising short term rates. Uh, and, you know, we can debate where we ultimately end, but without a doubt, that's the direction we're moving in. And that's good in general for bank earnings. Um, credit remains good. Uh, you know, the economy continues to hum along. So I see credit is very benign. And then I always come back to the balance sheets of the banks. These balance sheets are ironclad. They are better than they've been really at any point in history. Um, and that's obviously regulatorily driven, but that makes them safer and sounder. And they've really gotten no credit for that increase in safeness and uh, safety and soundness. But Tony, when you look at what the market cares about and what ultimately matters to profit, sometimes there's some daylight between the two. You mentioned the front end. The front end drives profitability, but it's seemingly the 10 year which shapes investor appetite for the financials. Tony, is that still the case? And what do you make of that? Yeah, so, so you're right. It's the, the short end that drives earnings. The long end is really a reflection of the market's view of the economy, right? And as the yield curve uh, flattens, there's a sense that the market is telling you that we're getting closer to a recession. But I think it's really hard to read any data from the long-term Treasury at this point because the Fed is still in the market buying, right? So we have an artificial uh, long-term Treasury at this point. And so I see as tapering begins, the potential for that 10-year to rise some more, and that'll create 
a, a steeper yield curve. Uh, and so I think you have to watch the economy, and it's less about long-term rates, it's about short-term rates, and it's about long-term economic fundamentals. Clinton, where did the banks fit into your asset allocation decisions this year? Yeah, I mean, we've liked banks for a while. Uh, a lot of the story was uh, steep in yield curve, uh, credit reserve releases back uh, uh, as, as banks over uh, over up reserves. Uh, so we, we, we like uh, financials. However, we like cyclicals and u u utilities a, a little bit more. I just want to get back to one other point, though, sure. regarding the Fed. Like, my concern is if we had a normal recession right now, like, what tools does the Fed have? We have to get off of this this point of, of stimulus, and, and they have to, to get to a more normalized environment where you can earn some yield checking account. You can earn some yield in, in, in CDs. So I, I am I am I'm, I'm looking forward to a more normal environment. And if we have a recession in 2024, 2025, wherever, the Fed has some ammunition to get us out of it. Clinton Warren, the conversation continues with Tony Despirito and Aaron Brown. Coming up on the program, the morning calls and later, Meta falling nearly 50% from a September high. More on Facebook still ahead from New York. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bell in New York City. Correction territory at the close in yesterday's session on the S&P. Down 10% from that January 3rd high. At the moment, a bounce back on the S&P, the Nasdaq, the Russell. The S&P up by eight-tenths of 1%. Yields bouncing back too in the last 24 hours. Look at this. Yields up at the front end by four basis points on tens by three. The curve just a little flatter here. The distance between twos and tens narrower. That's one to watch as we approach the first rate hike of the Fed. We're not there yet. That's the price action here in the morning calls. Let's kick things off with Raymond James upgrading Intel to market perform without a price target. Seeing limited room for further downside following its recent declines. That stock is up by about 1% to 4520. Deutsche Bank downgrading rock space to a hold expecting margins to remain under pressure following its quarterly results. That stock is down and down hard. And finally, Piper Sandler upgrading Marathon Oil to overweight, highlighting its strengthening balance sheet and favorable macro backdrop. That stock up by almost 2%. Coming up, a rough February for big tech. Facebook are raising nearly half its value in just five months. That conversation just around the corner from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Twenty-five seconds away from the opening bell this morning. Good morning. This Wednesday morning, a bounce. Can we call this a quieter one? For now, we can. Up 30 on the S&P, advancing seven tenths of one percent onto the Nasdaq. Up almost one thirty, up by nine tenths of one percent from New York City. With your opening bell ringing right now, switch up the board and get to the bond market. Your ten-year yield, a little bit higher today, up three basis points. The curve just a little bit flatter, 196.51 on tens. The Fed speak today led by President Daly. I'll get to the training diary a little bit later in the programme. Crude backs away, a third of 1% and 91.63. Euro dollar backs up for the US dollar. The euro side of things is stronger, 113.41. We're up there by a little more than a tenth of 1%. That's the cross-asset price action with some moves around the open. Back with us is Taylor. John, we talked about this stock a little bit earlier, and it's continuing to move now that we're getting the opening bell. So take a look at shares of Stellantis. Look a little bit better than expected outlook. Analysts are saying that even for bulls on the street, that this was a better uh, print here, targeting double-digit adjusted operating income and positive industrial free cash flow. Also in the auto industry, Tenneco, not something that we talk a lot about, but a $7.2 billion enterprise value deal underway. This is a company that designs, manufactures emissions control and ride control products for the auto industry. Activision Blizzard, again, our chief uh, gaming correspondent, Romain Bostic, says that delaying games is never a good sign. Change up the board. Let's go broader out to some of the big tech companies that we're talking about, because I know that you're going to talk a lot about Facebook, but this is a stock, John, that is down 47% from the peak in September and about 40% this year alone. So it is nowhere near a third 
$300 stock that we had earlier this year. As you can see there, you're at a $200 stock. Apple, again, off 10% from the peak in January. Amazon, similar story, you're off 20% from last July's highs. So here you're trying to get a little bit of a bounce, but we have a long ways to go. Some of the single name destruction has been absolutely mm -hmm. terrifying for the likes of Meta and Facebook. Taylor, thank you. Looking forward to the program after the close a little bit later with Taylor Riggs, Caroline Hyde, and Romain Bostick. Bank of America and Savita Subramanian breaking it down like this. Here's the quote. The fate of tech is far more important for the S&P than geopolitics. The S&P's direct exposure to Russian sales is 0.1%. But information technology and communication services are close to record weights of 37%. Back with us, Aaron Brown, Tony Despirito, Clinton Warren. Tony, we've done some real destruction in big tech for some big, big names. Meta we mentioned a few times this morning already, down almost 50% from the highs back in September. How do you approach that scenario, that situation, Tony, at the moment? Yeah, so it's not just the big uh, tech names. It's also the smaller cap, uh, innovative, disruptive companies actually have been in a in a, a bear market since the beginning of last year. If you looked uh, in 2021 at the small cap indices, value versus growth, the small cap value indice beat the small cap growth index by 25 percentage points. So uh, there's a real bear market going on there. And so it's certainly time for investors to start uh, picking through the wreckage. Now, there are some companies that deserve to be in that wreckage. I'll call them business, publicly traded business plans. Um, and that was part of some of the froth we saw with very easy money. But there's some really great companies that are growing fast. They're disrupting industries and they're going to become highly valued. Uh, that's an opportunity for stock pickers to go looking through the wreckage there. And Tony, I understand the reluctance to name them, but can you describe them? Just give us a better idea of how you find them. Yeah. So one is, like I said, you don't want to be buying business plans. You want to buy companies that actually have real profits and are growing those profits. You want to look for disruptors and companies that are disrupting big profit pools. Those are the kinds of companies you want to go after. And what you want to do is you want to have a long term view so that in three to five years from now, they start to look like they're attractively valued. Those are the kinds of companies that you want to go after. Aaron, this is the biggest challenge for the headline index, isn't it? At the headline level, what happens to that massive grouping of mega cap US stocks? I think that's right. I mean, the tech sector is 37% of the revenues for the market. And so that is going to be a significant driver for the S&P 500 going forward. We've had a really dramatic move in real yields over the last few months. It's about, been about 70 basis point move higher in real yields. And so that is going to take the froth out of unprofitable companies. And so you've seen that really happen in much of the growth index. But I do think that when you take a step back and you look at profitable tech, large cap tech that has real earnings, real cash flows. We're getting to levels here where they are very attractive to buy if you have a medium term horizon. And so I do think that as we you know, move past the Fed event in, in mid-March, and we, you know, the market becomes a little bit calmer about what the Fed intentions are in terms of the pace of the removal of accommodation. I do think that you will start to see money flow back into large cap tech and, and particularly, you know, profitable tech sectors. And potentially fly away from energy, which is where the big story has been, up more than 20% year to date on that segment, that industry group. Tony, that doesn't move the dial for the headline index. For the S&P, the weightings of energy, just looking at the Bloomberg right now, the member weightings on an industry basis, 3.5%. But that's where the massive gains have been, Tony. You've made the point, and I think it's an important one, that ironically ESG issues have actually helped that segment not hurt it. Tony, why? Well, so it's two issues. It's not, ES it's not just ESG. But one issue has been that oil has been in a recession since 2014, right? We overbuilt. We spent too much money on CapEx. And therefore, oil prices dropped and companies stopped spending. And there's a long-term memory there that tells that investors are telling companies, don't invest, give us back the cash. So that's part of the story. That's constricting supply. Then you add on to that uh, sustainability concerns, right? The fact that we know that there is an eventual end to oil consumption. I think there's a debate about the time frame, but we know that there's an eventual end. And again, that tells companies stop spending. Uh, the combined result is, you know, we've seen supply contraction uh, like never before. Um, you know, we're at an all-time low for new discoveries this year. 
And oil is about is a commodity, and it's all about supply demand. We have demand co- recovering off pre, you know, off pandemic lows, and then we have a very constrained supply situation. That is that results in high oil prices, and that's good for energy companies. Uh, and that's what's been driving these companies. It's not so much multiples; it's much more about earnings. Clinton, I want to give you the final word just on energy. The final word. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, clients are underallocated to the energy complex. Uh, if you look at portfolios, and they haven't been able to benefit from some of the, the recent gains that you're talking about. Uh, being here in Dallas, we have a lot of clients that are uh, are, are owners and operators of, of, of with th- throughout the energy sector, and unfortunately, we have not seen a lot of rate count increases. Uh, so, uh, to Tony's point, supply has not picked up, and. I would have thought at these levels that would have been uh, a reason for, for more companies to step in, but we haven't seen it yet. Uh, to Tony's other point, demand will pick up as the markets open up. And uh, I will say it is an interesting segment uh, to be on. We haven't talked about the pandemic. So hopefully that's behind us as we reopen uh, and demand continues to go. But uh, unfortunately, clients aren't as exposed to energy and haven't benefited from these recent returns. I get abuse every time I bring up the pandemic, Clinton. That's why we avoid it. That's not really why. But it's good news we avoid it now. The equity market up seven tenths of one percent on the S&P. The Nasdaq up eight tenths of one percent. Seven or eight minutes into the session, the retailers closing out earnings season. This is what we heard from the low CEO, Marvin Ellison, said the following. We remain confident in the long term strength of the home improvement market and our ability to expand operating margins. The latter point, Kaylee Lyons, the important point. Yeah, that's the critical point, John, because this is a very different story for Lowe's than it was for their rival Home Depot yesterday, where concern around disappointing margins actually took that stock down for the worst day since 2020. Lowe's, on the other hand, after a beat and raise quarter, beating on the margin front is higher by the better part of 4%. So it seems to be faring better on productivity and profitability than Home Depot is. And as for the other retailers that reported this morning, Overstock.com is absolutely soaring up 34% on, you guessed it, better than expected margin as as well as profit, but it's a move to the downside for TJX, lower by about six and a half percent. It missed expectations, said it won't provide full year earnings guidance given the uncertainty around how long elevated expense pressures may persist. So that's the point of the story, John. It all comes down to those cost pressures and the ability to pass on those costs. That all said, it does seem like this may be the low bar for uh, margins at this point. It may be the low watermark. Margins are expected to sp- uh, expand, according to BI, throughout the remainder of the year from the 6.2 level they have shrunk to at the moment. That outlook, though, has not done much to aid sentiment for the group as a whole. John, the discretionary sector is still the second worst performing in the S&P 500 this year, it's lagging the broader index with a decline of more than 14 percent. Only communication services has fared just fractionally worse year to date, John. Let's work through this issue together. And Kelly, thank you, by the way. Erin Brown, when you look at the step up that Kelly Lyons just painted for us, that picture for 2022, how much faith do you have in the step up, the improvement for margins as the year progresses? I think it really comes down to which companies and which sectors you're talking about. And we heard this through the fourth quarter earnings season, where some companies are really seeing the ability to be able to take margins higher and be able to pass through those costs to the end consumer. Where we're starting to see pressure and real differentiation, though, is in the lower end consumer, which is getting squeezed from the end of the child tax credit and from the end of stimulus payments. And as a result, is having you know, a little bit of pushback now with respect to higher costs. And so you're really going to start to see this play out in markets this year, where I think, particularly in the consumer sector, those consumer companies that are exposed to the higher end consumer are going to be able to continue to show strong profitability and margin expansion. Whereas those that are, you know, really exposed more to the lower end consumer, I think are going to start to have trouble in terms of passing through that pricing. Clinton, would you break it down in the same way? Yeah, I mean, throughout 2021, a lot of the clients that we have at uh, J.P. Morgan, they saw uh, an increased amount of of cost, labor, inputs, et cetera, and they were able to pass it on uh, to the end consumer. However, you're starting to see that kind of break down in in 2022 as prices uh, have skyrocketed and consumers are are starting to to move with with their feet. So uh, I think a lot of people have not priced in the margin compression that we're going to see in 2022, which will lead to, to muted returns and, and, and lower earnings uh, than I think a lot of people have previously expected. And Tony, final word on margins. The final word's yours. Yeah, so I have two perspectives. One's a macro and one's a micro. On a macro perspective, we have two forces. One is operating leverage, right? Revenue is very strong. That implies good operating leverage. That usually expands margins. 
uh, on the flip side, costs are rising. And so those are the two competing forces. And we see them at least balancing each other, maybe some actually upside to margins because the operating leverage is so strong. On a company-specific basis, it's all about pricing power. Does the company have pricing power to pass along uh, the rising costs? And so that's very much an individual stock selection issue. I think there's an increasing opportunity in companies that can pass it along, but with a lag. And so we're looking through companies where we've seen margin squeezes to say, okay, is this temporary or is this more permanent? And we're trying to take advantage of the companies where we see it as being temporary. So I think that's the, the task ahead for stock pickers. Some issues we can work through throughout the whole of 22. Tony, thank you, as always. Tony Despirito, Aaron Brown, and a Clinton Warren. Thank you very much to the three of you. About 12 minutes into the session here this Wednesday, up six tenths of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq, up eight tenths of 1%. Up next, coming up, the White House taking new measures to tackle supply chain issues. Almost exactly a year ago, I issued an executive order to prioritize strengthening our domestic supply chain. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Almost exactly a year ago, I issued an executive order to prioritize strengthening our domestic supply chain. If I was going to follow through on my commitment to say we were going to make it in America and build it in America, we needed a supply chain that was, that was reliable. President Biden focusing on supply chains with the administration announcing fresh measures to ease congestion. The Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg, saying this. We're proud to announce this funding to help ports improve their infrastructure to get goods moving more efficiently and help keep costs under control for American families. Emily Wilkins with us now from D.C. Emily, the big effort continues. Yes, I mean, we're seeing this $450 million grant being announced today. Now, granted, that's not actually going to be, money's not going to actually be going to ports until later in the year. But this is a part of President Joe Biden's push to make sure that the U.S. is addressing supply chain bottlenecks to try and bring inflation back down. Remember, President Biden last year visited a number of ports, was trying to encourage them to go 24-7, giving them the resources to do that, really trying to move stuff along. This is just another part of that effort. And it really speaks to the fact that Biden and Democrats understand that these supply chain backlogs, as well as inflation, is going to be is a major problem for them now, is a major problem for a number of Americans. And if it doesn't get dressed by the end of the year, could wind up really hurting the chances for Democrats to hold on to the House and the Senate in the midterm. It's been a big challenge for corporate America as well. Emily, thank you. We've got to leave it there. Emily Wilkins, Carrier Global just had their investor day. I'm pleased to say that joining us first here on Bloomberg this morning is the Carrier Global chairman and CEO, David Gitlin. David, great to catch up with you, sir. Let's just start right here. Two years as an independent company this year outside of United Technology. Has that independence given you an advantage to tackle issues like the one we're talking about on programs like this every single day? 100%, Jonathan. Thanks for having me this morning. Yeah, you know, the spin from UTC has been a complete new, new lease on life for Carrier. We think of ourselves as a 100-year-old startup. Willis Carrier invented modern air conditioning more than a century ago, but we have the energy and the focus of a startup. So we've been very focused on growth, margin expansion, and really cleaning up our balance sheet so we can play offense on M&A. And we've done all of those. Last year, we grew 15%. This year, we're going to grow another high single digits. Last year, we expanded margins 80 bips. This year, another 75 bips is what we expect. And when we spun from UTC less than two years ago, we had $10 billion of net debt. Today, we sit here, we have less than $4 billion of net debt. So we're playing offense on M&A. We announced the acquisition of Toshiba's HVAC business. We, we increased our dividend 25% this year. We announced the $1.6 billion uh, buyback program, and we have more firepower to continue to play offense on M&A. So, Dave, let's talk about the offense then. Debt load down, offense on M&A, and you mentioned the capital returns plan too. Can you walk me through how you balance the two? When you think about that extra money you've got is to reduce the debt, the balance between capital returns, M&A, and investing in the company. Well, our debt's now in great shape. You know, our multiple went from three and a half debt to EBITDA. We're now, we're now close to, we're about two. So in terms of our investment grade and our debt, we're in great situation. We've increased the dividend 25%. We've said that our priorities in order are organic growth, inorganic growth, and we will continuously look at dividends and share buybacks. So it's always a balance. 
we're really focused. We've increased our pipeline on M&A. There's a lot of opportunities out there, but we will be patient. And we know that the right deal on the right terms at the right time can create a lot of value, but we'll be patient, we'll be focused. And if we, the right deals don't go on, we'll uh, increase our buyback program. Dave, as you know, demand is there, but meeting that demand is expensive. As you look across three buckets right now, let's pick three. We can talk about logistics, raw materials and labor. Are you happy to say you've seen the worst in any of them? Well, in some respects, well, yes, in the sense that what we've assumed for 2022 is that the very high inflation that we saw in 4Q, it continues through the rest of the year. And we've seen it in all of those buckets. Logistics costs remain, remain very, very high. Just getting cargo from Shanghai to LA has been expensive for a long time and it remains expensive. And we've assumed that it stays at very elevated levels for the rest of the year. Raw material, we're pretty, we're hedged about 70% on copper, steel, and aluminum. So I think we're balanced in terms of where those are, but they're at elevated levels. We assume they stay at those elevated levels for the rest of the year. Labor is primarily a challenge in the United States. So we've had to take some discrete actions, but we think we're calibrated on that. And the rest of the year, I think we, for the rest of the world, I think we're fairly calibrated and managed there. Dave, lift the lid on that just a little bit more. It's on page five of your Investor Day presentation. It just breaks down the key data points for the company. Really simple stuff. 58,000 employees, 160 plus countries. You just mentioned there, Dave, the labor issue was focused in the U.S. That's where it's concentrated. Is this not a global story for you? It's very much a U.S. one. It is. It is right now. I mean, actually, more than 70 percent of our employees are actually outside the United States. But where we've seen the biggest attrition and some of the retention issues have been in the United States for a whole host of reasons. But it's been coming down. Some of the attrition levels have been coming down. Attrition, you know, some of the um, attrition issues out, uh, related to COVID have now gotten to very low levels. So that that's very encouraging news. But, you know, we've been working with our workforce in the United States. We've been adding a lot of jobs in the United States. We've been adding engineering. We've been significantly adding salespeople and digital. So a lot of great high powering, high paid jobs in the United States. But I will tell you that attrition and retention issues do remain a challenge here. Slide 11 was a slide that jumped out for me. And forgive me for going through slide by slide here. But Dave, just on the cold chain transformation, it's pretty obvious to me that you're not just a victim of the supply chain. You actually benefit from it as well. Are you seeing people put more money, invest more into the supply chain, not just wait for things to unclog, but invest more in it, that you're benefiting from that trend too? Oh, 100%. You know, you look at, what we do is cold chain distribution and 50% of vaccines, they never get administered in part due to issues with the cold chain. One third of all the world's food that gets produced never gets consumed in part because of issues associated with the supply chain. So companies are willing to spend more to improve the efficacy and, of, and prevent any of these excursions that happen. They're a big deal you know, for human, on a human level. They're a big deal on a financial level. They're a big deal on a sustainability level. If you look at all of the energy that goes into producing food that never gets consumed, if food waste were a, a country, it would be the third largest Unreal. emitter of greenhouse gases. Dave, those so, numbers yes, are nuts. The company's willing to spend more. Yeah. They are nuts. And I want to finish on this, though, the calendar. You mentioned that at some point you have to decide between making an acquisition or handing that money back over to investors. For 22, where on the calendar do you make that decision? We'll be balanced as we go through the year. There's no set point in time, you know, uh, Jonathan. We closed on an, a divestiture just a month ago. So we have plenty of cash on the balance sheet. We're looking at acquisitions now, and we'll continue to play that out as we go through this year into next year. Hey, Dave, wonderful to catch up. Let's catch up again soon. Fantastic stuff. Dave Gitlin there, the chair, chairman and CEO of Carrier. Almost called him the Chariot. Anyway, coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching. That'll be next in our trading diaries. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Just reminded, the most bearish price target on the S&P for year-end, Morgan Stanley, 4,400 on the S&P right now, 43.20, just south of that. Right now, up a third of 1%. The bounce fades a bit on the Nasdaq, up a third of 1% as well. That's the sector price action. Let's talk about an equity market that looks like this, the bond market that takes shapes as follows. Yields on tens right now. I'm going to show them. There we are, 198.95 on twos, 159.76. Here's your trading diary. The U.S. Treasury auctioning 53 billion of five-year notes at 1 p.m. 
San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly speaks at 3.30. GDP on Thursday, more Fed speak. Barkin, Bostic, Mester, Daly and Waller. And finally, closing out the week with some spending data. From New York, this was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.